years ago when I started my academic career, I came across a scholar by the name of Bultmann. I think he was the father of demythology. He proposed that Christ never arose from the tomb. There was no resurrection. You know, there's an enemy that wants to take away the precious truth about the resurrection of Christ and the eventual resurrection of saved sinners like you and me. And then I met another brilliant scholar, made friends with him. He was a judge, he was a professor, he attended one of my stop smoking uh, courses. And we made friends. And you know, he said to me, I'm an atheist and I don't believe in the resurrection. You know, if you only live for this life, what's there to it? Fortunately, we've got marvelous, wonderful truths. The resurrection of Christ. Now, what is your longest recorded time in shedding tears? Little ones or those inside of you? Have you ever spent an entire night weeping? The word for crying, shedding tears, will soon be eliminated from heaven's dictionary. After the early church discovered that there was a, a resurrection of Christ, they didn't buy tissues. I think tissues were sold out when Christ died. Tissues and handkerchiefs. But when they heard about the resurrection, they didn't sell so many tissues or handkerchiefs. Psalms 30 verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And if you're a weeping person, here's a resurrection message. Joy comes in the morning. Every day a new day resurrects from the darkness. And one of these days we'll have a marvelous bright resurrection when Jesus comes again. Scientists tell us that even tears has got medicinal value. You know, God is so kind. When he sees us crying, he's already got some therapy to help us come over our grief. They contain what they call manganese, and manganese affects the temperament for the better. You know, the mood swings. So tears tell us about sadness, but in those tears there is a therapy. Relief tension, they say, by balancing the body stress levels and eliminating buildups of the chemicals, making the crier feel better. Now don't go and cry to feel better, <laughs> but if you cry, there are some marvelous medicine in those tears that you are shedding. Leucine, encephalin, an endorphin that reduces pain and works to improve the mood. So this is also in the tears that we shed. Today, it's Friday. The day of the crucifixion, the day of weeping. Maybe you are in a Friday. But Sunday, the resurrection day of undisturbed joy is coming. It's Friday. Sunday is coming. It's Friday. A day of indescribable loss and pain. Christ died on a cross. But Sunday is coming. A day of eternal, everlasting joy. We are living in Friday. Soon, we will enter God's eternal resurrection of painless joy on a Sunday, another Sunday. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Christ died. We are weeping. Sunday is coming. Christ will be resurrected and we'll rejoice your Friday will soon be swallowed up by the resurrection joy.
For every death, there is a resurrection. It's Friday. They have lost. Can you imagine the pain of those looking at the dying Christ, put him into the tomb? But Sunday is coming when Christ, in all his glory, will be resurrected in our hearts. It's Friday, my friend, a very sad day. But Sunday is coming when the pure joys we have experienced long ago in the paradise, in Eden, the Garden of Eden, will be resurrected. So many wonderful things that sin put into the tombs of pain will be resurrected to new life. It's Friday, a day of dying. Sunday, a day of resurrection from the dark tomb of sickness, despondency and senselessness is coming. Friday is gone. Sunday is coming. It's Sunday. It's Friday. It's Friday. But Sunday is coming. The night of the first day of the week had worn slowly away. It was a very sad atmosphere. The darkest hour, just before daybreak, had come. Christ was still a prisoner in his narrow tomb. Here you see Loretta. This is the only archaeological evidence I could find in uh, the Bible lands. This is the tomb of the family of Herod the Great. And there you can see a typical stone that was rolled in front of the tomb. Now this is a little one. The one in front of the tomb of Christ was much bigger. The great stone was in its place before the tomb of Christ. The Roman seal was unbroken. The Roman guards were keeping their watch, the best that Pilate could provide. And there were unseen watchers. Hosts of evil angels were gathered about the place where Christ was laid to rest. Had it been possible, the prince of darkness, with his apostate army, would have kept forever sealed the tomb that held the Son of God. The devil wants to keep us forever in the tomb. But my friend, this is a great story. You're looking at a place in Jordan called Wadi al Karar. From this hill, Elijah ascended to heaven. But who was the first person to be raised from the tomb in this area? The very first one. It was Moses. What was Satan trying to do when Jesus came, Michael, to resurrect Moses? He protested. He wouldn't let his captive go free. He didn't want to have a resurrection here at Wadi al Karar of Moses. Typology? Yes. What happened to Moses? Where the devils guarded his tomb. God had the victory and Moses was raised up. And he represents Moses is a type of another Moses, Christ, who will also be resurrected. Visiting Christ's tomb, I said, they could not keep Moses in the tomb and they couldn't keep Jesus in the tomb either. We serve a resurrected Savior. I told my friends at the tomb, and usually we visit this very important site, a heavenly host surrounded the sepulchre. Angels that excel in strength were guarding the tomb and waiting to welcome the Prince of Life. They knew that he was going to be resurrected. And here you have the unseen host of angels excel in strength. Uh, one day we will go to the History Channel and relive the resurrection. Matthew 28, verse 2 and 3. Listen to this. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Why? 
for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Angel, earthquake. And came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on the stone. His countenance was like lightning, brilliant, and his clothing as white as snow. Can you imagine him coming down to the tomb with good news? Can you visualize him coming down to this planet in the vast universe? He's got his GPS right, right into coming to this planet, clothed with a panoply of God. The angel left the heavenly courts. Can you see it? The bright beams of God's glory went before him and illuminated his pathway. We'll see him on the History Channel one of these days after the resurrection. If you were one of those brave soldiers, how would you react to this bright shining angel and the earthquake that shook the earth? Verse 4, And the guards, the best that Pilate had, shook for fear of him and became like dead men. They couldn't handle the brilliance and the brightness of this one mighty angel. They experienced an earthquake when Jesus died. Same soldiers, some of them. And now there is another earthquake. What, what's going to happen? Now priests and rulers... Where is the power of your God? You wanted to keep Jesus in the tomb. But what's happening now? Brave soldiers that have never been afraid of human power are now as captives taken without sword or spear. What did the angel look like? The face they looked upon is not the face of a mortal warrior. It is the face of the mightiest of the Lord's host, Gabriel. Here we have a confrontation between Satan and God. I want to tell you, if you're on God's side, you'll never lose a battle. What was Gabriel's position in heaven? I'm so glad they sent him down. This messenger is he who fills the position from which Satan fell. The highest and the brightest angel, the mightiest of the host. Did Gabriel visit our planet before? This is very interesting. We cannot go into all the details, but he came to Daniel. It is he who on the hills of Bethlehem proclaimed Christ's birth. And now he's here again to proclaim his resurrection. I want to meet Gabriel one day. He's got a very interesting history to tell us. I was just wondering his emotions at the birth of Christ and then his emotions at this time of the resurrection. We're going to talk to these heavenly beings one of these days. Will Satan and his angels confront Gabriel or flee? What's the What's, going, what's the outcome going to be like? The earth trembles at his approach. He's not even at the tomb yet, and the earth starts to tremble. The hosts of darkness flee. They're gone. And as he rolls away the stone, heaven seems to come down to the earth. What a cataclysmic event. And what a revelation of divine power. I want to tell you, my friend, the devil is a defeated foe. Stay on the, Christ, stay on the side of Christ and you're safe. What about the soldiers who were supposed to protect the tomb? They see him, that's Gabriel, removing the stone, a huge stone, as he would... A pebble and hear him cry for the first time they heard an angel's voice son of God 
Come forth. Your Father calls you. Can you imagine those soldiers? What's going to happen? Is Christ going to respond to the call of his Father? Just look at the example of a rolling stone on top of Mount Nebo. How did the silent Jesus in the tomb respond to the call to come out? Because soon, when we die, we will also hear a call to be resurrected. What are the Roman soldiers going to see in less than a minute? They see Jesus come forth from the grave proclaiming, I'm the resurrection, I'm the resurrection and the life. They see him, they hear him. Can you imagine that? Christ speaking with a loud voice, I am the resurrection and the life. Maybe there was another tremor when Christ spoke these words. And I think the words echoed from galaxy to galaxy to galaxy. The battle has been won. He's paid the price. He's resurrected. And now he can ad administer the benefits of, of his death on Calvary. Did singing angels accompany Gabriel to the resurrection event as they did at the birth of Christ? I love the incidents where we have angelic choirs singing at important events. As he comes forth in majesty and glory, the angel host bow low in adoration before the Redeemer and welcome him with songs of praise. <laughs> so when Christ was resurrected, he heard the most beautiful, beautiful angelic choir welcome him with songs. We don't have the lyrics, but on the History Channel one day, we're going to listen to the angelic choir as they welcomed their champion. Can you please describe their joy when they saw their beloved champion come back to life? I think they sang as they never sang before. An earthquake marked the hour when Christ laid down his life on Calvary, three o'clock that afternoon, Friday afternoon. And another earthquake witnessed the moment when he took it up in triumph. Here's another earthquake. He who had vanquished death and the grave came forth from the tomb with the tread of a conqueror. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flashing of lightning and the roaring of thunder. So there was commotion when he came out of the tomb. What will happen when Jesus comes again? Is this a type of uh, the second coming? Hebrews 12 verse 26 says, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. What does this mean? Will the satellites be shaken out of orbit when Jesus comes a second time? What about the galaxies? We don't know. But I want to tell you it's going to a tremendous day when Jesus comes. Please don't miss out on the resurrection, if there's sin in your life, banish it, ask for victory, and be ready for the second coming. Loretta says, when he descended to Sinai, a place where we often visited, and proclaimed his eternal and changeable law, there was a strong earthquake. Can you see these mountains reeling? While well, looking while looking at the manuscript of the Isaiah scroll, I was reminded of uh, what this prophet, Isaiah, prophesied about the second coming. It's already there in the Old Testament, 1,500 references to the second coming. He says in Isaiah 24, it's a beautiful chapter, verse 20, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, interesting image here, and shall totter, like a hut. 
its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. The earthquake during the resurrection of Jesus was local, but when he comes the second time, it's global. This entire planet is going to shake. Here at the tomb where the earthquake, where the earthquake shook the surroundings, I realized it was a precursor of what? The second coming. A type of the end time earthquake when Jesus comes to shake this rebellious, cruel planet with its polluted atmosphere and satellites. He's going to clean up. Isaiah 34 verse 4 says, All the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. This was their writing books in Old Testament times. And when they finished writing, they rolled up the scroll. So this planet will be rolled up like a scroll. It means the mess will be removed. Second Peter 3 verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But you must read this in the whole context. In which the heavens will pass away with great noise. <laughs> the heavens. You, you will be able to hear the heavens making a noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. There's no future on this planet. At the death of Jesus, the soldiers beheld the earth wrapped in darkness at midday. But at the resurrection, they saw the brightness of the angels illuminate the night and heard the inhabitants of heaven singing with great joy and triumph. On Friday, it was dark. On Sunday morning, the darkness was dispelled by the glory of the resurrection. And when Jesus comes and we will be raised from the tomb, darkness will be dispelled forever. The Bible says in Corinthians, death is swallowed up in victory. Christ came forth from the tomb glorified and the Roman God beheld him. Their eyes were riveted upon the face of him whom they had so recently mocked and derided. In this glorified being, they beheld the prisoner whom they had seen in the judgment hall, the one for whom they had plaited the crown of thorns. But what a contrast! They must, must have been terrified, these soldiers. What a shocking contrast! This was the one who had stood unresisting before Pilate and Herod, his form lacerated by the cruel scourge on his chest and on his back, on his legs. This was he who had been nailed to the cross, at whom the priests and rulers, full of self-satisfaction, had wagged their heads, saying, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Matthew 27, verse 42. This was he who had been laid in Joseph's new tomb. The decree of heaven had loosed the captive. He's no longer in the tomb. He's out of the tomb. You and I will be out of the tombs when Jesus comes. I'm looking forward to that day. Are you impressed with the huge mountains in the world I once had the opportunity to go up in one of the Swiss mountains, Matteron, with a few cable cars. You know, to look at those giants, you are so impressed with the Creator. Mountains piled upon mountains over the sepulchre could not have prevented him from coming forth. You could have put all the mountains of Switzerland on that tomb, they would not have prevented Christ coming forth. 
He wants to be raised into our lives. At the sight of the angels and the glorified Savior, the Roman God had fainted and become as dead men. When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. They rejoiced. I think they had a big party. He's dead. He dared to hope that the Savior would not take up his life again. That party did not last too long. He claimed the Lord's body and set his guard about the tomb seeking to hold Christ a prisoner. This was the mighty Lucifer. He was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messengers. His obedient angels fled when they saw the brightness and brilliancy of Christ. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have an end and that he must finally die. Can you see Satan at the tomb there? He's a depressed man. What went on in the minds of the Jewish leaders? By day and by night, that awful scene in the judgment hall, when they had cried out, His blood be on us and on our children, was before them. They saw this picture by day and by night. Matthew 27, 25. Nevermore, nevermore, would the memory of that scene fade from their minds. Nevermore would peaceful sleep come to their pillows. There is no peace outside Christ. Who are responsible for Christ's resurrection? This is something interesting. When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, Your father calls you. The Saviour came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. So this was a cooperation with the Father, with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. Scripture to confirm this, John 10, verse 17 and 18 says, Therefore my Father loves you, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. So when his father called him, he had power in himself to raise himself. This command I have received from my father. So this was the counsel between the two. John 2 verse 19 to 21. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, he was referring to his body. And in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Over the rent sepulchre, over the rent sepulchre of Joseph, Christ had proclaimed in triumph, I am the resurrection and the life. My friend, if you have accepted Christ by faith, you have everything. These words could be spoken only by the deity. All created beings live by the will and power of God. They are dependent recipients of the life of God. From the highest seraph angel to the humblest animate being, little insect, all are replenished from the source, Christ, of life. The breath you are breathing now comes from him. Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. We serve a super 
Savior. Christ arose from the dead as the first fruits of those that slept. If Christ hasn't arise, we would never arose from the grave. He was the antitype of the wave sheaf, a yearly institution. And his resurrection took place on the very day when the wave sheaf was to be presented before the Lord by the priest. This was the first ripe grains that were taken to the temple, telling that there's another great harvest coming. So all the types of the Old Testament met their fulfillment in the antitypical Christ. What a rewarding study, the study of types, the study of Christ. The Jewish feasts of the Old Testament found their fulfillment in Christ. If you've missed Christ in the Old Testament, you are very poor. He is there. Go and look for him. Far more than a thousand years, this symbolic ceremony had been performed, pointing forward to the day when Christ would be resurrected. From the harvest fields, the first heads of ripened grain were gathered, and when the people went up to Jerusalem to the Passover, the sheaf of first fruits was waved as a thank offering before the Lord. So that very day, people were still celebrating the feast. They did not realize that the antitype has cancelled that feast. Not until this was presented could the sickle be put into the grain and be gathered into sheaves. The sheaf dedicated to God represented the harvest. What a beautiful feast with beautiful symbolism. So Christ and the first fruits represented the great spiritual harvest to be gathered for the kingdom of God. His resurrection is the type and pledge of the resurrection of all the righteous dead. I'm so glad he includes us in his resurrection. When he arose, we arose with him, says Peter, says Paul. And we are sitting with him, in him, in heavenly places. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. He's waiting for the big harvest, my friend of you and me, to take us to heaven. Could he present to the Father the first fruits of the great future harvest? Remember, he had to take, to fulfill type, a few people to heaven, telling the Father that these represent the great harvest that's coming. As Christ arose, he brought from the grave a multitude of captives. You know, when I, when I read this, I was thinking, Walking in Jerusalem. Who were they? The earthquake at his death had rent open their graves. That was three o'clock on Friday afternoon. And when he arose early Sunday morning, they came forth with him. So when Christ arose, many graves were opened and those people arose. First fruits. Who comprised this company? Those who had been co-laborers with God. Are you a co-laborer with him? And who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth? For instance, Isaiah was sown in two pieces near the Kidron Valley. Maybe he was one of them that arose. I don't know. We'll, we'll check the History Channel when we get there. Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised them from the dead. So Christ met with these resurrected ones, telling them what happened that weekend, telling them, them that when he arose to heaven, will, will go up to heaven, they will 
come with him. I think they were excited. Oh, the Bible is such a wonderful book. So many wonderful truths in it. Can you think of people whom Jesus raised from the death, from death to life? You can just use your imagination. What pain when she died? What joy when Jesus resurrected the daughter of Jairus? Death is so painful. To lose a child, I think, is the greatest pain there is. So these parents experience that pain. And can you imagine when they embrace their little one, she's back with them in life. Have you lost a child? Because Christ rose, your deceased son or daughter will rise at the second coming and you'll be able to embrace them again. Come with me to another little village called Nain in Upper Galilee. What happened here? I love these stories. There's a little chapel church that they built here. What will we find inside this church? Let's, let's walk in. Look at this picture. It's portraying the widow who lost her only son. He was the breadwinner. He was her pension. He was her security. Christ came from the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. He met the procession before they could bury him. Christ rose him from the dead. Can you see mother and son embracing? Are you a widow? Have you lost a son? Come with me to Bethany. We're going to visit another resurrection. Don't miss the visit to Lazarus' tomb. Buy a few, pay a few shekels and you go, can go in. Now, Loretta reminds us of the shortest verse in the Bible that was spoken right here. Do you know the verse? Jesus wept. The smallest verse in the Bible was spoken here at the tomb of Lazarus. Two words, but it speaks volumes. Christ weeps for us. He prays for us. Would you like to go down? Let's go. This is what it looks like inside. I took a picture of a description of what's happening there. John 11, 43, and he, that's Christ, cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Watch him as he struggles to get to the voice that, he, that called him from life to death up these steps. I think that was a struggle because they covered you with death cloth all over. Of course, when he got up, Christ said, remove, remove, remove the death clothes. John 11, 44. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. Can you see the picture? And his face was wrapped with cloth. You know, he had to... I don't know how he got out of the tomb. Jesus said to them, lose him and let him go. <laughs> Can you imagine the two sisters embracing their brother? The resurrection morning is going to be a tremendous joyful experience, forever safe with our loved ones. Loretta reminds us of something here at Bethany, <clears throat> where Lazarus was raised. If God, if Christ didn't mention his name, what would have happened to all the saved ones in the tombs? Man, <laughs> the entire city would be filled with resurrected people. But this was just an individual. But you know, these resurrected ones were not clothed with immortality. After they were raised, they were still subject to death and they died. But those who came forth from the grave at Christ's resurrection were raised to everlasting life. They were types of the antitypical wave feast. They ascended with him as trophies of his victory over death and the grave. 
So Christ brought this trophy to his father. These, said Christ, are no longer the captives of Satan. I've redeemed them. Look at them, Father. Look at this. The first fruits. I've brought them from the grave as the first fruits of my power to be with me where I am, never more to see death or experience sorrow. Sorrow will not be found in heaven. What kind of feeling that must be. The fear of death is forever gone. You know, we all fear death to a lesser or greater degree. It's not a very pleasant thing to look forward to. It's the cruelest thing that sin could have brought to this planet. But soon, the word death will never be mentioned or experienced. They went into the city, these raised ones, and appeared unto many, declaring Christ has risen from the dead, and we be risen with him. I wonder if they visited uh, the Sanhedrin, Pilate and Herod. But wherever they went into the city, they proclaimed the truth. Maybe this one person says, I'm a, a Isaiah. I wrote about this event, and here I am. Christ has risen. This is good news. The resurrection is very good news. Who were these Old Testament, Old Testament martyrs? Who were they? Did they visit the temple? I wonder. Reaction to the chief priests and rulers? These poor people never slept a decent night's rest evermore. For the first time, they see and hear immortal, safe people. Can you imagine? Somebody coming to you and say, well, I lived 600 years ago. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel and uh, telling you that Christ rose or Ezekiel or whoever. We're going to check the History Channel. A taste of what heaven must be like. This was immortalized. The sacred truth of the resurrection. The risen saints bore witness to the truth of the words. Isaiah 26, 19, Your dead shall live. My friend, your deceased loved one shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. The resurrection was an illustration of the fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 26, 19, Awake! And sing. Be resurrected and sing. You would dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs. Beautiful imagery. And the earth shall cast out the dead. It says here, yeah, awake and sing. In other words, at the second coming, when we are raised from the tomb, we are going to sing a song. What do you see in this picture? To the believer, Christ is the resurrection and the life. In our Savior, the life that was lost through sin is restored. What a gift. For he has life in himself to resurrect whom he will and he wants to resurrect us after we've died. He invested, he is invested with a right to give immortality. He's allowed to do it, invested to do it with us. The life that he laid down in humanity, he takes up again and gives it to humanity. Did you get the message? The life that he took up in the tomb, he gives to you and me. John 10.10, 10. I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Everlasting life. It was here at Jacob's well that Jesus spoke immortal words to an mortal sinner, the worst lady at Shechem. 
John 4 verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Guess what I prayed when I drank the water from Jacob's well? I think you, your guess is correct. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. The voice that cried from the cross, it is finished, was heard among the dead. It pierced the walls of the sepulchres and summoned the sleepers to arise. Thus will it be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven one of these days. That voice will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs. And the dead in Christ, your father, your mother, your child, shall arise. We haven't got the intellect to imagine what this would be. I'm looking forward to this miracle. At the Saviour's resurrection, a few graves were opened, but at the second coming, all the previous dead shall hear his voice and shall come forth to a glorious, immortal life. When I was young, I enjoyed life. I had such a lot of energy. Life was so Super. We're going to be like young people in heaven with all the intellect, with all the energy to praise God throughout eternity. Please guess what my prayer is for you and for me, the sinner. Father in heaven, thank you for the wonderful message of the resurrection which is a guarantee that we too were raised from our tombs, never more to die, ever more to praise thy name. In Jesus' name, Amen. Mm -hmm.